Controlling Detroit after the bankruptcy, plus raising the gas sales tax for roads. Also, election 2014, spotlight on the 11th Congressional District and setting the agenda for Michigan's future. It is all coming up tonight on My Week. Recently, Michigan's economy has begun to turn around. Michigan's gained over 250,000 new jobs. We've paid off $20 billion in long-term debt. And our population is increasing for the first time in a decade. But to make Michigan a top 10 state, there's still plenty of work to be done. Step up and help put Michigan on top. Learn what you can do at michigan-turnaround-plan.com. Funding is also provided by Delta. Hi there, welcome to My Week. Thanks so much for joining me. I'm Christy McDonald. It was a busy week. The focus is on Lansing and some big decisions being made on the roads, the minimum wage, and Detroit. The growth of the state and where we are headed will all be topics of conversation among business leaders and politicians next week on Mackinac Island. It is the 34th annual Mackinac Policy Conference put on by the Detroit Regional Chamber. This year, there are three major themes there. Entrepreneurship, looking for ways to encourage a culture of innovation through policy policy, capital, and talent. Also, impact, confronting the state's real problems and building a government structure to attract new investment and jobs. And finally, STEM education, a focus on science, technology, engineering, and math to make sure Michigan employers have access to talented individuals. It is a one-of-a-kind conference, as you see, this is scenes from last year, and in fact, only one of its kind in the nation. And the reason for that is simple. We're so used to thinking of ourselves as a particular community or a particular region, uh, but at the end of the day, we're all in it together. You know, what happens in Detroit impacts the economy in Grand Rapids. What happens in Lansing impacts the economy up in the UP. I mean, we are very interconnected as a state, and it's easy when we're running our businesses or doing our policy back in our hometowns to think about us only in the region in which we operate. But Michigan is a global player. And we will start with not only how the official agenda impacts the state, but really the unofficial agenda, the conversations that happen up there that may or may not settle a lot of state policy. Nolan Finley is here from the Detroit News, and Stephen Henderson is here from the Detroit Free Press, our My Week contributors. And gentlemen, we're heading up north next week. We are indeed. Yeah, so let's go ahead and take a look at the conference as a whole, because they do have their agenda that they've been working on all year and um, having speakers that, that support that uh, as well. And this really is um, a unique conference that does have a lot of conversation for the future of Michigan. Well, yeah, I mean, it's a good agenda. And there's, there's a lot of very um, uh, high-level speakers, so that, so the stimulation of good ideas being discussed will, um, as always, be part of... Or, or, or dominate this conference, but also over the years, this has been an incubator for big ideas and and for, quite frankly, deal making, where you know where the business and political leaders come together uh, in private conversations and deal with some of the state's big big issues, big problems. This year, of course, they'll be trying to wrap up and finish this Detroit bailout package. So there'll be some arms twisted, some promises made. They're also knee deep in trying to get some transportation funding, a transportation bill passed. That'll dominate, uh, and there will be other issues that are discussed on the porch or in off rooms that aren't on the agenda but are very important to Michigan's future. And this is a unique conference. We talked about that it's one of its one of its kind in the nation, Stephen, and it still has a place, and it feels like it's still it's still growing as well. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, it seemed like the the conference had some, something of a rebirth with, with uh, news sort of energy. Uh, the governor decided to use it as you know a big platform for his agenda, which I thought uh, breathed new life into it. Um, and Sandy uh, Barua has really upped the, the the sort of ante in terms of the kinds of people 
he brings in. I mean, you think of the people we've seen just in the past few years, Thomas Friedman, uh, Michelle Rhee. This year we get Malcolm Gladwell. Uh, those are very, very big names. Uh, and, Joel Klein. And Joel Klein uh, has been there. Um, you know, we, we get a lot of we get a lot of star power now, which is which is very cool. We get Paul Begala and uh, uh, Sarah Cup this year as well. So uh, the conference has changed, and I think sort of risen in prominence and in and importance in terms of the way people think about it. No has one it, wants to miss it. Has, has it gotten over the, the hump of, well, you know, it just could be a boondoggle for our state leaders to go up and spend some time on Mackinac Island? What's well, a boondoggle for us? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I mean, It'll never still... get over that. I mean, there will always be people, well, they don't do anything. Up there. It's not a <clears throat> policy-making conference. It's a policy conference. It's a place to discuss ideas, uh, put some things on the table, and see if there's any support for them. Uh, but would you say, though, to people who have never been to the Mackinac Policy Conference, who are a jokey public sitting down here who will never be there, would you say, though, that the conversations that happen up there actually do impact yeah, everyone course. else's yeah. lives? I mean, yeah, and it's in inevitable that some uh, big turn will come out of that, some big decision will be made or deal will be made. But what we have to keep in mind, too, is it's not publicly funded. This is a private organization. Everybody who goes up there pays their own way. Uh, I don't know about the politicians. I don't know who's paying their way. But uh, the conference itself is not publicly funded. This is a, a private enterprise. All right, so let's go ahead and talk a little bit about a lot of the conversations that are going to be happening up at Mackinac that are actually happening in Lansing this week. So let's start with Detroit. Uh, Mayor Mike Duggan was up there this week, again, lobbying uh, lobbying for that funding. We're getting very close, I think, to, um, to passing some of these bills and also hearing that some of the unions are starting to kick in some funding, something that you didn't think that maybe we'd see. Oh, I'm but surprised. I mean, I, you know, but it's, I think that's uh, really what's moving this this. Uh, deal forward. AFSME had been very much opposed to the grand bargain, to the plan of adjustment. I think AFSME still opposed, but the difference this week is they've, they, they're, they're, not, they're neither supporting nor actively objecting to the bills on the table. So they freed up their Democratic uh, supporters to go ahead and vote for this package. That was, a, that was a key development. I think the UAW coming in is going to soothe over, over some of the objections House Speaker Chase Bolger and others had about the unions not participating in this $815 million um, grand bargain. I really th see things coming together. We're the closest that we've been. Do you think, Stephen? I think so, and I think uh, you saw uh, the mayor up there, not by himself, but with the city council president, which I think was very key. I can't remember the last time I've seen the mayor of Detroit with the city council president testifying in Lansing and basically saying the same thing, right? Not not uh, contradicting each other or fighting uh, over over the details. Um, I, I think that makes a big difference. And, and the case he was making was, look, you know, things are different in Detroit now. Not only are we working together, but we're moving in the right direction and we are paying more attention to to, to how we spend and how we budget. And you know, if you, if you give us this money, uh, it gets us out of the bankruptcy and we will be able to, to sort of talk about when we might be able to, to govern this place without any oversight at all. Uh, I, I thought he did really well uh, up in and I thought Brenda Jones, uh, the city council president, did very well in, in, in her testimony. There the is some concern is about the, the parameters for oversight though. Well, yeah, I mean, and, and they're being adjusted. They've been being sort of eased all yeah, week. Yeah, they listened. Adjusted all week. Right. Um, they were pretty uh, strict at the beginning. I thought but, they were. But, you know, this is a lot of money for the <clears throat> legislature to commit. And these fellows have to go back home and say, look, we gave Detroit $200 million, but we've got these assurances that the money won't be squandered. So some level of oversight was essential. I believe that uh, what they're coming up with is probably reasonable and, and fair. Uh, you know, the hope is that this thing gets settled before everybody goes to Mackinac, at least through the House, so that all they have to do up there is work on the Senate. If this falls apart in the House, we go up to Mackinac next week with just an abs absolute mess on it. It'd be pretty well, chaotic. Let me ask you this. What could make it fall apart in the House? Almost anything. Yeah, I mean... Well, no, not almost anything. Tell me, what could make it well, fall apart? You know, they're still fighting over... Um, as, as Steve said, the, the level of oversight, and there's still... Well, you've got groups lobbying against mm -hmm. it now. I mean, you've got uh, some Koch Brothers-funded groups who've jumped in and said they're not in favor of this. On the other side, you still have uh, far-left uh, uh, groups sort of questioning whether 
uh, they could get a better deal if more of the art was 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 on the table and 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 whether sales were on the table. So you've got this weird alliance right now. Police and firefighters have. Police and firefighters have. So what on far right and far left? Far right and far Almost left, both everywhere. sort of saying, well, we're not sure about this for different reasons. Um, but but you know, I mean, this is a this is a very high stakes. Uh, uh, proposal here. I mean, and it is it is unique in the history of of, of bankruptcies. Uh, certainly, everything in this bankruptcy is unique in the history of municipal bankruptcies uh, because we've seen so few of them. But uh, there's no such thing as as this kind of a deal being worked out through the court uh, uh, in the middle of a bankruptcy. So it's unusual uh, even for private bankruptcies yes, right. to have a third party to have commit this sort of money to commit that kind of money to to make sure that somebody's assets. Uh, stay intact. So if you're Kevin Orr and you're sitting back and you're <coughs> watching this take place because he already went up to Lansing and he did his lobbying and he did his testifying, now you sit back and what are you waiting to hear or what are you thinking at this point? Well, you've got to be feeling pretty good, particularly I think um, the UAW's uh, money and the Carpenters' money that came in, the building trades uh, money that came in. You know, that signals uh, that you, you've got a pretty good chance of getting the Democratic votes you need for a bipartisan deal. I think, I mean, we're talking Thursday morning because we tape early, but I believe by uh, uh, this evening or tomorrow, the House will have passed a bill, yeah. and they'll have passed a bill that the Senate can live with when they come back from Mackinac. Do you agree? Yeah, I think so. I think we're close, and, and you know, I think the governor <clears throat> deserves a lot of, a lot of credit. Uh, he's been the one who's pushed this through Lansing and gotten people to, to, to think about, you know, the importance of the city and the importance of, of getting through the bankruptcy. And, you know, it, it looked just a couple weeks ago like maybe this wasn't going to happen and it would just be too tough. Uh, but behind the scenes, he's really been able to get people to... I, I got to say, the roller coaster of, of, of watching this deal go through or not go through, I mean, there has been so many lurches, and it's going to happen. Whoa, it is not going to happen. Something just came out of left field, and it's going to go forward again. Yeah. This has been... This is all uncharted stuff. This is a... Uh, we've never... No community's ever been through a bankruptcy of this nature, and so everything that's happening is happening for the first time. All right, so let's go ahead and talk <clears throat> about some of the other things that are uh, going on in Lansing right now, specifically road funding and the minimum wage bill. First, let's take a look at the idea of raising the gas tax and putting that money to road funding. Now, this is really gaining steam, and, it, and it's a steep increase in, in the tax. What, about 25 cents more over, what, yeah. four years? Right. Well, it's, it comes out to about a billion four, which is about what we need. Is this, is, is this exactly what we needed to do from the beginning instead of... The well, gas of course. tax? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. S some revenue. Yeah. You gotta all right, get it so, from so, I, all right, so Nolan, make the case for the gas tax. Well, I mean, I'm not sure the gas tax is is more prefer uh, is is preferable to um, a registration fee or or a sales tax or whatever what i know is that these roads aren't going to fix themselves <laughs> so whatever <laughs> method they come up with for funding they've got it it's got to be consistent it's got to be long term yeah. and it has to be enough this right. use this business of trying to use a few extra bucks here and there and divert money into the roads it's these roads are in too bad a condition and we're all paying for it already yeah, so the, the, Randy Richerville, I thought that was a very courageous proposal. Oh, in sure. election year, you see members of his caucus, oh, no, no, we can't do that already. But at least somebody has finally introduced uh, real legislation to raise the kind of money we need to fix these god-awful roads. All right, is that going to pay off for him? Uh, I suppose. I mean, if it gets through, I, I, I still am not sure about gas tax either. I mean, I think... Why uh, not? Well... Uh, the automakers are making more and more fuel efficient cars, right? Uh, and people are are using less gas because because of that. So if you if you raise the gas tax, um, in the short term you'll get money, but in the long term that could end up yielding less. But I think I and I haven't had a chance to really dive but into it's the this wholesale. Yet, but uh, they've switched it also to a percentage rather percentage than, rather than and so as right. gas prices go up it should it should, should yeah. counter that. I mean I think I still think that that uh, we we ought to pursue this idea that that was raised but didn't seem to get much discussion this week in Lansing about about a sales tax increase uh, and whether you could put 2 cents on the sales tax split it split it 1 cent for uh, roads, which would get you about a billion dollars, 
uh, and then put a cent on there for something else. Well, that's you what I was going to that's what I was gonna bring up because you wrote that column uh, this week in the Free Press, and it, it was the interesting thought of if you're going to do that for roads and put just that extra two percent for roads, yeah. why aren't we having the larger conversation of um, I have some ideas of where that if you're going to raise things. the sales tax, please pick the on level, me because I can tell you exactly where I'd like to see some. Oh, of that well, money the level that's just did. I mean, this everybody thinks there's an appetite in Michigan for a two a two cent increase in the sales tax, and everybody wants it. Education wants. That universities want it, um, healthcare wants it. So you two prioritize. Cent, everybody can't get two cents. If Is everybody there real? Gets now wait a minute. Cents, it's a twenty percent sales tax. Let's go back to the fundamental question of is there an appetite for a 2% raise on the sales think tax? So. 6 percent is a pretty good sales tax. Yeah. You start going to 8% and you know that is a very regressive tax in, in a in a state where household income still haven't grown much over the last few years. Yeah it's high but but we also have uh, you know a decade or more of unbelievable disinvestment particularly at the higher ed level uh, and and uh, in terms of uh, cities uh, you know local local governments um, we we are not keeping pace to to maintain this place to maintain our because we set different priorities Steve okay we've set priorities we're gonna lock people up and we're gonna expand the welfare state here. Well, okay. and we've made those choices and so we got less to so you, you got education but you can't you can't go to the people and say we've made our spend these spending priorities now we want different priorities but we're not going to shift money we're just going to ask you for a whole well, you lot can, more. I think you can I think you can do both I mean I think you can you can institute prison reform although that that has gone nowhere in, in I was just you know, I was just going to say there has been no conversation about that. Uh, I, you know I, I don't think we can afford to wait for those things to, to sort of unlock themselves for us to reinvest in higher ed or for us to deal with the local government funding crisis. I don't think that Michigan Michigan families, Michigan taxpayers can afford to keep dipping into their pocket to fund inefficient government and a government that won't set priorities. Okay, well now we're arguing about a, a, a shift in sales tax or raising sales tax <laughs> for something that we don't even know what it would be allocated yeah. for and you're already saying well, it's an bills. inefficient use of the money. Well, what I'm saying is six cents <laughs> is probably a high enough sales tax. Remember, we was we were at four cents for the that longest time here, ago. and we shifted six cents to change the property tax right. formula. There's no trade-off this time. It's a straight hit to uh, consumer pocketbooks. All right, um, I'm going to jump into the minimum wage conversation mm -hmm. because that conversation is happening up in Lansing as well. As um, the GOP, are they just trying to head off this ballot proposal and? And swoop in there and and make a change, so this I will not this end up was, on the ballot. I thought this was a pretty crafty uh, way to avoid that, you know, avoid that that ballot initiative, and and essentially leave Democratic voters, who were the ones who were the most most energized about it, you know, without a big issue to bring them out. So this isn't a good policy decision. This is just well, basically a political decision. Well, I don't, th you know, again, I think I think. Again, the minimum wage is one way to put more money in, in people's pockets. It is not the most efficient way. Uh, I mean, we talked before about there are other ways to do that that don't, um, that don't impact employment uh, quite as much. Uh, expanding the earned income uh, tax credit uh, is, is the most popular way. But, of course, Republicans don't want to do that, and they've been taking money out of that. Uh, the governor uh, did that in his in his first budget. So well, I mean, it's not really a when possible. When we had the earned income tax, it didn't stop this constant um, uh, drumbeat to raise the minimum wage. What the Republicans in the Senate did <coughs> here was choose bad policy over worse policy. They went to 9:30 instead of 10:10. Well, what difference not does it Not much difference. Make? So when you're, is you're still slamming small business people. You you're still putting the jobs of entry level workers at risk. We've got record high ten teen unemployment. That'll go even higher. It's it's absolute, and plus they indexed it to inflation, so your business costs go up automatically every year, whether productivity and prices go up or not. You're going to put a lot of people out of business. So do you have people sitting at home then saying, okay, well, great, so they're choosing bad policy over worse policy, mm -hmm. so bad policy is supposed to equal good policy? Well, it doesn't. It's, it's not good. Policy. It's not I bad don't know what policy. They're well, I mean, it's not bad policy. It's been raised eight times at the federal level since since we had the minimum wage and. The economy always grows afterward. It, it 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 shrinks employment in the short term, but as the economy grows, it always catches up, and and we always have well, expansion. We are not That's growing why. now, Steve. We're not growing. There are a lot of bad policies that are dragging down this recovery. Why add more? I'm I'm not I, sure. I'm not, Michigan I'm businesses not arguing can with that. It's, this hit. In the long term, it will not make it will not make the negative difference that it will now. All right, likelihood that this is going to happen. 
I don't think it'll get through um, the House. I, I think can't it'll be see tough it. in the House, yeah. And so then you go, I think they should go and make the case to Michigan voters why this is bad policy, why it will hurt the, the most vulnerable Michigan citizens, but you got and why it'll put small businesses out, out you of You got 65% of the people now saying they want it. Uh, this, mm -hmm. if, if it gets on the ballot in the fall, a lot of those voters are Democrats and independent voters who did not come out in 2010. It's going to be a, uh, it's going to make it tougher for Republicans. Although the Center for Michigan study did not show a whole lot of passion for this issue. That well, is I mean, true. it showed that the 65 percent of the people support it. Okay, but it didn't, it did, the, the passion wasn't there for, oh, we're going to go out and vote just for this. Well, it, right. That's I true. love how I say to Stephen, last word, and it never ends up, <laughs> it never ends up being that way. Is it my fault? All right. Also, a big <laughs> announcement for Detroit, $100 million investment from J.P. Morgan Chase over five years for grants and loans to spur investment in the city. Is this a, what does this say on a larger level to the rest of the country? Wait a minute, are we done talking about Mackinac? We, we, <laughs> because we didn't talk about Steve and I's bourbon bar. Bourbon bar. <laughs> this is the Thursday most important night. part. I, I, I'm sorry, did you hear a segue to that? I, I, don't, I don't know. I, I thought I segued to something else. 7 o'clock. 7 o'clock <laughs> on the, the lawn Grand of the Hotel. Grand Hotel. Steve and I hosting a bourbon party. Everybody on who's coming to the conference, welcome. You're welcome if you're not coming to the conference. Okay, <laughs> thanks. Um, come up for the thanks. Party, uh, Nolan just hijacked the show, but um, I'm back in control. So let's talk about what uh, the investment uh, that uh, was given this week. Well, what does this signal to the rest of the country? So, I, you know, I, I said something to, to Jamie Dimon when he, when he was here yesterday. I said, you know, I could spend $100 they million. Had drinks. <laughs> I said, I could spend $100 million in a weekend in Detroit and not, you would not, see the difference so so tell me why uh, this is this is something we should be excited about what did he say? And what he said was he said actually I could give you a billion dollars to spend in Detroit over the weekend and you wouldn't see a difference he said the problems here are that profound but it's the targeting that that they're doing with this money uh, working with uh, invest Detroit uh, working with uh, the mayor's office figuring out the things that are really dragging down <clears throat> neighborhood development so uh, gap financing, you know, uh, the the lagging property values in neighborhoods, figuring out ways to get loans to people to fix up these houses that the mayor is auctioning off, and then expanding that to the commercial corridors that are near those neighborhoods that that don't have any businesses on them, be, in part because businesses can't get loans. They are really uh, sitting and thinking about how to spend this money, this $100 million, in a way that builds capacity, lending capacity, uh, fixes the market, uh, the, the, the irrationality in the city, so that it will have much more effect than just that that hundred million dollars. It's a huge piece. No one... money draws money, Christy. <clears throat> I mean, you you think about um, Detroit, and we went through the the corruption scandal at City Hall, and then the bankruptcy, and you'd think investors would be running away from the city, and that's not the, the case. I mean, this city is drawing outside investment, and so this hundred million dollars from um, J P Morgan Chase. Others will look at that and say, hmm, you know, we had the Golden Sachs. Goldman's coming, already here. And, and, you know, the Gilbert money. <clears throat> and the people will say, well, maybe there's something to this. And there is a lot of investment excitement about Detroit. Uh, at a time when that just defies logic, and it's very encouraging. It takes a few big steps for then other people to, to jump on, in on it. All right, let's take a look now at election 2014 and the 11th Congressional District Republican battle between incumbent Kerry Benavolio and challenger David Trott. Congressman Benavolio is involved in some legal skirmishes with a former staffer, and while Trott's ads are running, not everyone is thrilled that he's touting himself as a job creator. And I wanted to talk about this this week because I'm really seeing a lot of the ads, and this, is, this, is, this race is heating up. Plus, the, the two of you got into a little bit of a battle on social media this week about an article that ran in the Detroit Free Press talking about Dave Trott's background, yeah, essentially. Well, well, I mean, this is a guy who saw the foreclosure crisis, identified uh, growth opportunities, right, Biz things that would come out of that that he could specialize in and made millions and millions of dollars off of it. There's nothing wrong with that. It's not illegal. Uh, it's, it, you know, there's nothing, there's is, nothing in the canon of ethics just, for lawyers. That's not quite accurate either. He's been in this business <laughs> for years, yeah, for well, decades. He also he developed some things. He didn't see the mortgage crisis and say, aha, he's been in the mortgage servicing business for years. Right, and, but some of the things that he was doing, he did develop specifically he, after he, the foreclosure he, crisis. He, Dave Trott uh, did not foreclose on a single home. Well, no, he, the banks he didn't say he did. Home. It's like blaming divorce attorneys for a marital breakup. Uh, he's an attorney. This is what attorneys do. 
and he has created a tremendous business out there and an awful lot of good jobs out there. And if his business and his people hadn't serviced these mortgage foreclosures, somebody right. else would. Yeah, but there's also, no one, there's what, nothing opportunity. But there's what's, also, what's wrong, what's totally wrong with the, What's wrong with a, a, a big background piece, though, on, on who Detroit is? Because yeah. I would argue well, that not many people do know who he is. Well, it smelled like a, a cheap shot, a manufactured scandal here, and there was not one thing in that story that suggested unethical no. behavior, what it, illegal no. behavior, what it or suggests, that he was exploiting anyone. No, but, well, but what it suggests is that he's profiting off other people's misery. Oh, and that's, so, well, I, what lawyer does is that, is that, that lawyer does is that somebody, does that disqualify well, you? I mean, but he's not just a lawyer. He's somebody who's he also, running for the he, U.S. House. He also does deed, uh, uh, House closings, yeah. deed service, yeah. whole lot, whole range of other businesses. Right. He, but he's made, but he's gotten state. wealthy but off got, of this you know, foreclosure thing. is full thing. of lawyers who have done the same thing, uh, who have profited out of people's agreed. Misery. But that he's is running. Most, but he's running for Congress here, and we did a story that showed who this guy is. Well, that's see, all. Pick a congressman here who wasn't in the law. All right, uh, as you can all see, of them you know. Uh, and, uh, all of, and somebody's miserable. Thad McCotter, John Conyers, John Dingle. Uh, there's we have John Dingle was a lawyer. When name somebody else. Congress. Name somebody else in our delegation okay. who's done something like what Dave Trott did. All what right. did Dave Trott do other than run a law? Lo profited off of a clients. lot of people's and we're financial gonna, misery. And gentlemen, That's we're going to have to leave it there. Off the <laughs> we're going to have to spend a whole show on this one. That'll do it for my week. Thanks so much for joining us. We're going to be on Mackinac Island next week. We'll see you then. Take care. Sorry about that, guys. Recently, Michigan's economy has begun to turn around. Michigan's gained over 250,000 new jobs. We've paid off $20 billion in long-term debt. And our population is increasing for the first time in a decade. But to make Michigan a top 10 state, there's still plenty of work to be done. Step up and help put Michigan on top. Learn what you can do at michiganturnaroundplan.com. Funding is also provided by Delta.